I contemplate all the causes and conditions and the kindness of others by which I receive this food. So at every lunchtime, uh, we recite various contemplations and we pause for a moment, of a moment or two um, to contemplate them. And so for this particular one, contemplating all the causes and conditions and the kindness of others by which you receive the food, uh, the amount of time that we pause gives me a few moments to recollect that the food that's there on the table didn't just magically appear. That first of all, someone had to kindly cook lunch. Thank you very much, Nima, today. Um, but further than that, there has been so many hands um, that have been involved in the various networks of causal conditions that have brought the food here now. And to really engage in recognition of that, I need more time <laughs> than those few moments. And you know, the idea is that we do carry over those um, reflections into the first half of our meal here, which we eat in silence. Um, and at this time when we're hearing about the huge food lines that are occurring because people don't have access to food right now with the food banks being overwhelmed with demand for food and yet on the other side of things where we have farmers who are having to build ditches on their property to um, let the food that they're growing rot because the market for their food, the restaurants, are no longer buying it. So there's this incredible paradox um, going on where the normal flow of things just isn't working right now. And so for me, this brings alive the need for gratitude, really, for the food that we have here, much more closer to home. And it also uh, makes more tangible the fragility of the dependent arising that is the food that we eat. Um, yeah. And so uh, I've been wanting to recognize the person behind the food more. Um, because I don't understand actually a lot of the processes that go on in terms of actually all the food production because there's so many stages involved that I'm just ignorant to a lot of these things. And so I was inspired by, I think, uh, sharing the Dhammadi talk that Venerable Sampton gave uh, sometime last year where she went through all the various causes and conditions that bring about from a tree to our fruit bowl an orange. Uh, so I wanted to do a little bit of that today in a, on a smaller scale. Mm. And so mm, in light of the teachings as well that we received just this weekend from uh, on the book, How to See Yourself as You Really Are, the need to generate this gratitude for others' kindness was also uh, heightened in terms of, you know, we recite many times throughout the day, may I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. I think it was yesterday morning that Venerable mentioned that, you know, sometimes, you know, we say these words, but they, are they going beyond just words? Are they actually reflecting a sincere um, wish from our side? Um, and that will take practice to develop that sincerity. Um, but that practice involves for us cultivating compassion. And in order to cultivate compassion, we need to develop a recognition of the suffering of others. And also uh, seeing others as lovable because we recognize their immense kindness that they have given us, they have directly contributed to our well-being. And so what more easy way could there be than to recognize the kindness um, that we receive in terms of the food on our plate, um, where others have contributed to one of the direct necessities that we need to live. And so by coincidence today, we do actually have quinoa on our table. Um, <laughs> I, ch I chose quinoa because I'd heard that it's um, the production of it is complicated. Um, but apparently it's actually quite easy to grow. Uh, it doesn't take too much care and it's quite hardy. And because the seeds are actually coated in this soapy um, film of saponins, then bugs don't really um, interfere with it too much. So the growing of it's not quite a problem. The harvesting, however, is a difficult aspect. Because um, apparently the plants grow and they have different arms or pa panicles, as they're called, and they mature at different times. So a lot of widespread crops, they can just be harvested um, by machines. But you can't do that with quinoa. Our quinoa is hand-picked. Um, so people with sieves go along and they, har they inspect the plants and they harvest the different panicles or the different arms of the plant according to when they're ripe. Because if, they were if they just machines went through, 
um, there'd then be some panicles that wouldn't be right, the other ones had already like shattered and the seeds had been lost. And so yeah, there is a person behind with a sieve hand picking our quinoa seeds that we're eating. And then so after they pick the, the pick the panicles and that, they lay them out to dry for a couple of days. And then they actually drive tractors over these dried out um, uh, limbs of the plants to kind of crack open um, the seeds and expose them. And then different people, um, what do they call it? Uh, they thresh and then sieve the seeds. And there were some nice photos online that I saw where it's like this like, kind of, they, must, they may have been uh, harvesting red quinoa or it's just the soil that they're working with, but this kind of like pink uh, film rising up from what they were threshing. So they don't have any masks on or anything, but yeah. Um, so then there's people doing that for us. And, I think about 80% of the quinoa that we that in the world is produced in either Bolivia or Peru on the um, salt plains, um, and because that's grown in volcanic soil, it's, they have to sieve it to make sure there's no glass coming through to us because there's lots of quartz in the soil. So we have people making sure that our quinoa we don't get glass hidden amongst the quinoa that we're eating. And I think in Bolivia, uh, most of the farms are about 10 or some of the farms at least, are a 10-hour drive from La Paz where um, it gets processed again. So you know, there's people producing and then someone driving 10 hours into the major city um, before it gets packaged up and then um, color sorted um, <laughs> to remove foreign um, particles and then separated into the different varieties. Um, it goes through color sorters. So there must be some machines that can do that somehow. And then I think most of the quinoa now is pre-washed for us to get rid of, so we don't have to, you know, I think soak the quinoa overnight and get off the soapy. So that's just someone's done that for us, and then it's re-dried, so then it can be packaged again, and then I guess distributed all across the world. And I think uh, in in Peru at least, most of the quinoa is still in small family-owned um, farms, and it, apparently the increase in uh, Quinoa demand and then production has really benefited the women there because a lot more of the women are, uh, I think, 40% of the farms are owned by women now. Um, so that's given them a, a sense of a source of income that wasn't there before. And so that there is just one element because then there's the people who produce the packaging that the quinoa is packaged in, the truck drivers and the plane drivers who tr transport it across the world. And there's the people in the shops who are stacking the shelves, who are um, staffing the cashiers to be able to sell it to us. And then for us, the people here who um, offer our food every fortnight to bring it. Um, so the immensity of what has to happen in terms of um, the growing, to be able to meet us, be able to walk into the kitchen of Ramonima, to be able to walk into the kitchen this morning and cook a couple of cups of quinoa for us for lunch. And so, yeah, just seeing the human, um, the heart, the sentient being who wants happiness and doesn't want suffering behind uh, what can appear so, so strongly as a source of pleasure or a source of aversion or just indifference, got to eat so I can go on and move and do the next thing. Just slowing down enough to actually recognize that um, warms the heart and I think uh, at this time where we might be feeling a bit isolated in different ways or quite consumed by what's going on in our lives, it, it opens the heart to feel connected and uh, nourished by uh, what other people are doing in this world to support us, whether they're doing so intentionally to support us, me specifically, or not. Uh, this morning I also had a look at what's involved in the uh, production of dates, which is, I know some of us here quite like dates, and apparently they have to be hand pollinated. So there's the male trees and then the female trees. And even though they might be um, grown quite close to e next to each other, they have to be hand pollinated. I have no idea what that means <laughs> or what that involves. But that's one of the reasons why it said that date, or I think medjool dates particularly, are so expensive because of that intensive process of hand pollination. And then also the different... The dates ripen at different times, so they have to be continually monitored to pick them up at certain times and then packaged. And just you know, what goes on in terms of um, getting us what we need or what we like and what sustains us, what allows us to take the next breath. 
Um, and I think at this time we might not so much have this objection, but sometimes the objection does come up as I've heard questions in um, teachings before of like, well, they didn't intend to benefit me through the work that they did. You know, they're getting the living for it, they're getting the money to be able to go and do, on, do whatever they else they like in their lives. But that's not really the point here in terms of rec the, recognizing the kindness of the people who produce our food. Yes, they might not have had me specifically in mind, but without their livelihood, without their toil, their work, I wouldn't be able to eat. I wouldn't be able to live. So it kind of it goes beyond the direct intention of benefiting me. Um, yeah. And so I just offer that as a um, another thought to in increase our uh, meditation on the kindness of others, um, recognition that goes beyond just the the mere the strong appearances of what it, what we encounter throughout the day where. I don't see the uh, strings of interconnectedness. I just see this one object appears and I react to it based on the feeling that it generates within me. And there's so much more than that. And if I leave it at just reacting to the mere appearance, I'm not turning it into a cause for awakening. Whereas if I can react with it with some recognition of the kindness of others and the interdependence of what brings me into contact with this particular object, then I can work, turn it into um, a spiritual practice and something that can grow my heart and affect the way that I interact with others positively and then hopefully um, yeah, create the causes for awakening. And I just wanted to take this time as well to express uh, gratitude for myself, and I think as I've heard it expressed from the whole community, to the people who offer food to us here. I mean, we have the for fortnightly food offering team, which involves so many people, actually. Even just the one, one occasion of shopping every fortnight, I know, involves many hands. And then there's the people all across the world who offer to our food fund. And then the many people who just send us care packages without any request, and we have continuously received them in this time, and these packages just show up on our counter, and it's just amazing, the generosity, um, and that keeps us nourished here, both physically and also um, emotionally and spiritually, to have that support. 